Thank you to those of you who were here from earlier today and have joined us this afternoon, and welcome to those of you who are just joining us this afternoon. Our first speaker this afternoon would be Yoshika Wada. Yoshika is a scholar, curator, artist, and founder of Slow Fiber Studios. Her publications include Shibori, The Innovative Art of Japanese Shape Resist Dying, and Memory on Cloth, Shibori Now. Her latest film production includes Natural Dye Workshop with Michelle Garcia, Colors of Provence Using Sustainable Methods. And I believe she mentioned today that she has a second edition coming out. Welcome, Yoshida. Thank you. I thought I would um, thank you so much, Tamara, uh, Luciana, and um, David. Nice to see you again here. And it was an, an uh, event in La, Ro La Rochelle. I saw them. Um, just, I thought I'll give you a brief background what I have been doing. This is my latest sort of passion, Natural Dye Workshop. Uh, you can go to the website very easily. And the first one um, I produced is the Colors of Provence. And it is on cotton printing and uh, mostly. And the ward is a distinctoria extraction and totally organic reduction, like fruits, peels, and fructose, and henna. And you don't have to use hydrosulfite and, you know, theorurea and things like that. Um, also, he had taught us amazing uh, discharging of mordants with lemon juice and things like that. Anyways, um, if you purchase, I think my husband is going to come and help me <laughs> later, book signing, and the publisher is bringing a couple of my books. Um, you can purchase this uh, DVD. It's on the web as well. And you get, uh, there's a web uh, email, if you email to that address, you get a password. And what I'm interested in is that like-minded people get together and really exchange information, empower ourselves, and then um, try to kind of realize all our dreams and agendas. So there's this bonus page up on top. Um, it says bonus notes. If you can go there, and there's password, and you have to type in the password. And you, ha you can download um, uh, chapter notes. The, um, the first chapter notes, there's Ellie Noble, my colleague, wonderful natural dyer, was responsible with Kathleen Ellis. And we're all working together to um, propagate the right way to work with natural materials. So this is one thing, and it's very easy, naturaldyeworkshop.com. And another thing, this is part of the slow fiber. This green circle you see is something I found it. Oh, by the way, I'm producing next film, which is the um, colors of um, the colors of Ameri the Americas. And this one, uh, excuse me, why? Oh, yeah, there's something on this screen, but that's okay. Um, so this is going to launch, uh, come out at the TSA, Textile Society of America Conference, in September at Washington, D.C. And um, I have an organized session on sustainability, but it's not just, we're not just looking at ecology. Uh, we have a organic um, cotton uh, people from um, uh, South India, um, enlightening us with the uh, state of um, farmers and uh, agricultural practices and so forth. And those things, you know, we have to be able to sustain the practice in not only just organic way, but also social and a community and economical way. Um, and uh, there's another one that, that Slow Fiber Studios I have um, founded. This is the fourth year. We have um, uh, programs um, in regularly in India and Japan, but you can you can go on the website and and look at it and see what we do. And it's interesting. Um, Ise Miyake actually Ise and her, his partner Makiko, who went to school a few years later than I did in Kyoto. Um, a, a good friends of mine as well. And then Issei talks about making of things. 
And this is a real direct uh, translation of monozukuri, which is Japanese. And this is the kind of thing that I don't, uh, idea that I don't hear in like uh, American designer, amongst American designers or European designers. They're really kind of grounded with materials and, and the making of things. And so this is like how, what is the meaning or meaningful way to make things and then to learn how things are made. And that's sort of the kind of thing. And I've been president of the World Shibori Network and we have just finished the um, set eighth international symposium at Hong Kong Poly U in Hong Kong and HKDI Design Institute there. In 2008, we did, we did one at the uh, University of Lyon where Dominique Cardon helped us and also uh, Musée du Quai Brandy and the Paris American Academy. So um, we have, we're trying to get members also access password pages, and then we have, you become a member and you can have your own pages. And this is just kind of a low cost way of having more exposures and, and networking and helping empower all of us. Okay, so today I would like to talk about Benny, which is a Japanese word for red. And um, let's see. I want to show you a few things before I start. So um, how many of you know about uh, safflower red? It's a very particular shade of red. Great, not too many because it's not as well known. And um, actually, these are different shades of, they're not as intense. Actually, Kazuki did this, Yamazaki did this at Ice End and um, quickly, but these are different shades of red. First you get yellow and then red. I won't go into the technical stuff. Um, and I, do, I did find the real safla red uh, itajime, and this is faded, as you can see. It is not a stable color, and it fades easily. It's a very weak against sunlight. So if you want a good fast dye, it's not. It's a putty. It's not even putty tint. tint. <laughs> it's it's not a so good of a color against sun. Um, and this one I think is also red, but it has been kept. Um, so it's a little darker. And this is a contemporary replication of this technique, itajime, which I'll talk about. This one is also, oh, also a synthetic. I mean, it's red, but it's synthetic red, as you can see. So, and it's difficult for people to know when I talk about like safflower cake. This is the safflower petal cake. And this is the cotton dyed with safflower benny. And it gives this very distinct pink color. It's very different from silk. And this is probably about 100 years old, this garment. Um, and this is a set of two garments, which was the garment. And normally, nowadays, outside is sold, and inside doesn't get sold that easily, which is a shame because it should be sold as a set. So inside layer, lining is red. So traditionally, this was Benny, okay? And this is the under layer, so it has this part, it's called donuki, which is the torso part is a lighter fabric which was always decorated in this particular technique of, of red and white. Once in a while you see like blue and white, but that's, that's an anomaly. And so the outside would have been this beautiful grayish color, hand painted, embroidered, and all outside. So the ladies used to wear, this is of course upper class, wealthier people would wear two sets as a garment. 
so this is another fashion idea. Um, you know, and then also only the wearer knows this is hidden underneath. No one does. No one else sees it. So um, there's one, well, I'll just go on because I have so much to share with you. Today I'd like to talk about the color red in women's fashion, focusing on Beni Itajime, textile of Japan. So this one is Beni Itajime. Beni means red, Ita means board, Jime comes from clamp, clamp. So this is a red clamp resist carved board clamp resist dyeing, if, if I translate it. This was dyed in a particular hue, hue of red called Benny, obtained from the petals of safflower. It's right here, Gathamas tinctorius. And this unique art of red dyeing is solely developed, this pattern dye, resist dyeing, solely developed for women's undergarment or kimono lining, as you saw it. And I saw the complete set, as I was telling you. Outside is that, and inside you see part of it is in red. It's quite beautiful. In the past um, few hundred years, they have been uh, doing this um, decorative process. And it's a very esoteric carved board clamp resist dyeing. And a um, few days ago at the trend, uh, trend Focus presentation, Lee Edelcourt spoke of myth and fetish in a stream of ideas about romanticism, a theme for upcoming trend. In these historical textiles I'm going to share today, you can see women's longing for mystic power, passion, love for life, feminine appeal, and a kind of fetishism, which is interesting. The red color of Benny, so these are the boars. The red color of Benny was so costly to extract that it was actually worth more than gold. The sumptuary law of shogunate government prohibited the use of this red color among the, could you turn down the, yeah. Ah, so close. So the shogunate government prohibited the use of this red color among the common folks. Naturally, if you cannot have it, then you want it more than ever. Does this sound familiar? And furthermore, the red color is not fast. I suppose that is a reflection of nature's transient quality and it also becomes more precious. And red, um, along with white and black, has been the most consistently important color in fashion. According to ancient Chinese text, in primeval times, humans first perceived the colors white and black, as seen in light and shadow, and in day and night. Then they perceived red, as seen in the sun, fire, and blood, the source of life and the symbol of life itself. From the viewpoint of Japanese aesthetics, the colors red, white, and black are also the most constant and most important. White is associated with purity and Shinto religion. Red is the color of the sun goddess, Amaterasu Omi no Kami. You see the symbolism in the design of the flag. And um, black is an important color for formal presentations and occasions. And it's sometimes associated with mourning, so you have to be careful. Um, people are not as traditional as before, but um, so these two shows women's and men's formal wears, and you see predominant use of black. In early days, safflower was valued for 
its medicinal merits, as were many other plants, such as purple gromwell, uh, which is a long botanical name, Lithospermum propurocarulium. Uh, among their many uses in traditional medicine, safflower petals have been known to reduce pain and inflammation, trees, treat tr um, respiratory tract and other infections, and very importantly, stimulate and regulate the menstrual, fl menstrual flow. The yellow-orange Benibana flower, we call it Benibana, and you can see from this picture from Edo period, the um, probably daughter of wealthy merchant is wearing red on the kimono. And a uh, yellow-orange Benibana flower contains a pigment that is like 99% yellow. The special red pigment constitutes only like 1%. And I, I don't go into the detail. Time doesn't allow me to go into the detail of um, extraction of the dye, but you can imagine how laborious it is. And the safflower plant originated in um, Egypt, and it is believed to have reached Japan through the ancient trade route during the reign of 16th Emperor Nintoku between 313 and 399 ACE. Scholars have found evidence of its use in Egyptian dynasties. The culture, um, the culture and technique of Benibana cultivation and extraction of Beni dye became central to the regional economy in the north during the Heian period already, which is 794 to 1185. It was a costly luxury item and often mentioned in the poems and tales written by Heian period courtiers and women writers of that period. And during the Edo period, 1603 to 1868, urban or privileged class women, in addition to courtesans, of course, applied elaborate makeup, white, often lead-based, paste on skin, and beni, made from the safflower, for lips, and eyeliner and the undertone for eyebrows, eyebrows before adding black highlights. You will see the uh, red eyeliner at the side edge of the eye opening in the makeup of kabuki actress who, who plays, performs women usually. It makes uh, women look shy but coy, a desirable combination of feminine, feminine, feminine attributes Sometimes wealthy women use Benny to lightly tint their nails. Tinting cheeks was not so common since blushing is a display of emotion that occurs in particular context. So you don't want to <laughs> have your pink cheeks all the time. You might send the wrong message. <laughs> and... Um, so also interesting thing is that married women during the Edo period, besides shaving their eyebrows having a, after having children, their eyebrows painted their upper front teeth in black with an ink-like substance made from a combination of iron, acetic acid made from fermented rice bran and sake water kind of thing, and tanning from a plant. Black symbolized chast chastity as it never changes color. Also, it was believed to prevent dental cavities, but not sure. This practice has been recorded since the Hay, actually much earlier, Heian period, 794 to 1184. Even sometimes noble men um, painted their teeth black. So, and then they shaved their eyebrows and they painted these round eyebrows on upper. Um, forehead. Okay. Oh, interesting thing I wanted to point out, and I, I, this is a trade secret, secret, and I read lots of books, and not too much is written about cosmetic use of red, and this is the Benny. This is the lip coloring, and they had a way to apply this color uh, red 
uh, Benny onto this beautiful little ceramic cup, like a sake cup. And it would end up on the surface iridescent green. And it then was painted into lips in red. So, um, and you can see the women putting a little red eyeliner kind of line here. I think you see that here. That's, that's what I was talking about. Okay. Looking at the history of reds in the world, oh no, wait a second. Before that, we should mention the Japanese matter plant. Um, okay, here. Uh, we call it Akane, Rubia tinctorum, has been another source of red. Unlike the unstable, almost fugitive color of safflower dye, of which, uh, when exposed to sunlight, it becomes very um, unstable. Mother is a stable dye and yields a beautiful, fast orange red color when processed with um, aluminum rich ash from camell camellia branches. However, it could not compete with the obsession Japanese women had for the red hue of Benny. And we don't know why, I mean, we, we know kind of largely because it was so prohibitively expensive, it was um, fugitive and all that interesting thing. So I guess, you know, fashion is, is, is created with kind of a psychology. Psychology is a very important um, factor. Of course, people, all the people talked about cochineal and looking at the history of reds in the world, cochineal red stands out, um, commonly called carmine or crimson lake, a dye um, based on this carmenic acid. Um, we, we know what it is. And it was actually um, used since ancient times in the Americas by pre-Columbians most notably in Peru, and later by the Aztec, Maya, Mystic, and all these people. And its cultivation and extraction use and, and use spread um, widely along the, um, during the colonial, Spanish colonial era. But actually, these pre-Columbians domesticated the uh, cactus to lose thorns and they domesticated the cochineal to yield more red. It's a very sophisticated um, practice they had. In the long history of colors, there are other well-known dyes derived from insects, um, which other people talked about. Um, red lac, uh, lac still produced in India and Kelmes. And, um, Kermes was used widely um, in Europe, Middle East, North Africa, and so forth. And after discovery of um, cochineal in the Americas, and which, which Elena Phipps wrote a quite wonderful um, uh, uh, book called Cochineal Red, The Art History of a Color. And um, the color itself, the red, has been associated with power and status in many parts of the world, and also with courage, heroism, and danger. For example, fire engines, Red Army of the Red Red Army of the Russian Revolution, or British red coats and things, which is interesting. But in Japan, it was women's color, largely, of course. Warriors did use red, preferred in some cases, but I will quickly show you uh, this interesting resist um, patterning process and um, and the brief history of the most current, most recent, last of this practice done in a um, place called Takasaki. It's um, it's a north of Tokyo. It's near Kiryu, actually, which is a well-known textile center. And this Takasaki being away from Kyoto, but close to the new capital of um, uh, Tokyo, new capital of Japan. And um, they, they enjoyed a, a prosperity, very brief period, 
in 18, uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. And um, actually, Yam I don't know, some of you know uh, more about Japan. Yamagata Prefecture in the north produced about 70% of Beni. So um, you can go to their website. Did I put their website? No, I think I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, there is a website. If you email me, I can, I can send it to you. There's a quite good, thorough uh, museum, Benny Museum, an English translation of all sorts of information. And so this is um, Takasaki in late 1800s. And this was one of the dyers who just produced this Itajime. And another reason why they prosper, pro prospered there is that they, ha they uh, around Takasaki, um, there are lots of sericulture being done. And there are villages who wore very thin uh, lining silk. You sew the, this very thin lining silk dyed in red and white. And so it was, the material was right there. And, um, and these are the boards. Some of them has to have perforation. Some of them have uh, ways that dye would penetrate through. And there are several boards. There are ways to notch them so you can have them um, all uh, lined up. So these are some of the, rep I think this was replicated from the old one, and I'll show. This is a new one, that reproduction they made. And so it's, it's pretty elaborate. It's very elaborate. There is a group of uh, research, uh, researchers in that area, and they provided me with these um, informations. It's, it's really uh, interesting. Then they, the dye has to be poured in from the side, and uh, it comes out like this. And that's how it was used. So not only the skill and artisanry, but the kind of oblique sense of beauty that characterized Benny has largely disappeared as modern technology and the Western influence permeated the Japanese society. No more kimono, no more precious color, no more restriction for women or for common folks. However, the color red remains alluring, uh, evoking love, passion, and the feminine. It continues to enrich the vocabulary of fashion and design. And one last note I want to add is the comment about the, uh, um, the recent uproar against the use of carmine red in food based on the fact that it is made from insects, leads us to recognize the fact we're part of the huge sphere of organisms where one feeds upon another. The teaching of botanist, chemist, and dyamish Michael Ga Garcia gives us a broader view of the natural world, showing how every living creature must devise ways to survive and propagate how we are part of nature's scheme to keep the living system going on Earth, and how we humans can use the nature to our benefit without destroying it. This is a profound inquiry that both designers and consumers are challenged to answer. Thank you. So a um, few minutes for questions. If you have any questions for Yoshiko, this is a good time. If not, we can uh, move to the... Uh, round table when when we'll get there you'll have a better chance to ask specific questions yes ah no okay well, um, yeah. I have a yeah. yoshiko hello um you talk about benny in terms of fashion um, i can see it's been used for kimono um how is it used in japan uh, you've talked oh. about the production of Benny in northern Japan, but yes. how, is he, how is it used in fashion terms? Okay, well, this was the fashion, this was past, and what happened was that when uh, synthetic color red came in in late 1800s, it actually practically wiped out 
uh, Benny production, there are only few farmers still produce this and make Benny cake. And main customer, or main, main consumption is by the Imperial Household Agency because uh, in Japan, Imperial Household Agency and like Ise Shrine, which is rebuilt every 12 years. Ise Shrine, if you go there twice a day, twice a day, priests have to make the meals for the god with the wood and start fire and everything is like continued from ancient times. So there's certain thing, there are certain material items have to be dyed with Benny. But I think this Benny would be very interesting material for lipstick, and And it was supposed to have given this iridescent greenish tone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> All righty. So uh, let's move on. <laughs> Thank you, Yoshiko. Okay, we'd like to welcome our next speaker for the afternoon, Peter Weber. Peter is the CEO and founder of Blue Sign, technologies, environmental, and occupational health standards used by major manufacturers and branded retailers worldwide. Let's welcome Peter. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation to come back to fashion. So my former life was, I was sitting on the other side on the table. So I was the guy who has to make the product what the designer needs. And uh, that was very challenging. So I was working for many famous fashion brands, the Pradas, the Gucci's and so on. And uh, we decided 12 years ago to make something in a direction for a more sustainable production. Then what I see, I saw over years in our industry was not so nice when we are talking about uh, the use of chemicals, the use of resources. And we try to develop something that helps us to make the right decision at the end of the day. Very important, it's not the CEO that makes a decision. It's the guy in the dye house, in the lab, who has to select the chemicals, that we get the performance, that we get the color you need, if it's a synthetic dye, if it's a natural dye. And we have to give them some help to make the right decision. So my presentation, it's very, very, very strange. Be, <laughs> be careful. So uh, I will talk about hazard, exposure, and risk, all these strange things. Normally, designers don't like. But at the end of the day, we are dealing with chemistry. And a little bit about toxics and emissions. We have always, uh, if you are working in a sustainable or non-sustainable way. So first of all, I start with hazards. And this is our daily life. So when we are talking to brands or to product managers or to designers, the, this I like the most. I trust on my supply chain, yes. I can tell you, don't trust your supply chain. And this is also our daily life. Reach, that means this is the strange or very difficult chemical legislation we have in Europe. So also in the future, if you are producing natural dye stuffs more than a ton, you have to fulfill the criteria, and they are really heavy. We are talking about substance of very high concern. We are talking about CPSIA, the legislation in the States, or especially in, in California, uh, Proposition 65. But at the end of the day, we are also confronted with recalls. That means we have a problem, a bigger problem. Or what at the moment is the, the biggest challenge, and I would say 30% of my time I have to spend for that. Maybe you heard that Greenpeace attacked several uh, larger brands. And uh, definitely now we know we have 
a bigger problem in our supply chain and what can we do to help these brands to come out from this uh, strange situation. So, Paracelsius was a very intelligent guy and he uh, made the statement so that more or less every substance is a poison. That's a fact. And uh, is salt a poison? Salt is many times used in textile industry. Think about dyeing of cotton as one example. Is this a poison? Salt, we have that always in food. So the nicest little dose is 200 grams. So what does it mean for us? So if I have a look on the homeopathics from my wife, I can find arsenic oxide, I can find mercury and other nice, nice stuff, toxic seeds, toxic snake, be toxic, so uh, is this really a hazard? Okay, also a car can maybe kill human, could be a hazard, <laughs> or a knife is a hazard if it's not used in the right way. And chemicals we know uh, we have special labelings for chemicals and we deal every day with chemicals. Think about the washing agent. We have a labelling on if we buy fuel. And now we come to another important thing that is exposure, how we are exposed. So in textiles, a very good example from my point of view, from a risk standpoint is is if we have a typical sweat management, so if we have close to the skin effect with the exposure, open pores, a mechanical movement of the textile on the skin surface and sweat where we can extract chemicals from, from a textile. Or an exposure is also food or it could be an exposure in other areas, so the exposure is very important and especially if we go now one step deeper in the production, the worker are exposed to chemicals and that's a big issue. And at the end, that's my specialty. We do not take care about our environment, I can tell you. Air emission is a big issue in our industry. Water emission is a big issue. And what can we do? We can minimize the risk, and we do that, for example, with the car. We train the people. We have some guidelines. We can improve security steps, and at the end, we get a license, and then if we don't follow that, we have to pay a fine. But we can also reduce uh, the risk. We can protect the workers with tarnish, with helmets, and with ropes. So we can do something against that. So that was the basis, more or less, for risk assessment. So then I can start with the risk assessment. And this is the thing what we have to do. If we want to do, if we want to applicate a chemical, whatever source it is, we should know a risk assessment. First, we have to know the hazard on one side. How hazard is it? On the other side, we have to know the exposure. That's totally different. If I have a carpet here, or if I have a, uh, a running shirt, and then I can make a risk assessment. And what do I need? So for a typical textile product, that is, as an apparel, we have diff different scenarios. One is expo uh, exposure to skin. And there we have the therm thermal exposure, and we differentiate between acute or a chronic exposure. Also, we have that situation. If we have a dye house manager, he has always is exposed to chemicals every day, so he has uh, definitely a chronic exposure. Oral intake, you know the kids, that's an is issue. Then. Inhalative exposure, if you have textile in a room, is, uh, for example, this carpet is an exposure. And then we start calculating. So now we start mathematics. Everybody's ready? So <laughs> this is 
only a part of three pages where we calculate uh, chronic thermal exposure. So we have to know, for example, the exposed skin area, the migration rate, uh, what percentage of the chemical that the body can resorb, uh, the body weight, and so on. And then we can calculate a margin of safety. And we have the philosophy at Blue Sign that we have 1,000. And now we are back to the salt. With salt, we have only 20. So back to Paracelsius that shows exactly. So we are dealing daily with chemistry. So if it's natural, if it's synthetic, we have to take care. We need some rules. We need some a scientific background. We need a risk assessment to really say this isn't uh, a risk or it's not a risk. And we have to work in a way that we have no risk. Especially what we have to do as a brand is we have to protect the consumer. We are not interested in recalls on, or that we expose uh, workers with chemistry. So we have to find a way that is safe. So that's our idea. Now we go to uh, the problems we have in our industry. And I like this slide because you can see here a lot. So we have always an input on one side in a mill. And we have always a workplace. So we saw some nice picture this morning. Maybe you remember the dyers with the blue hands and so on. So work, a worker, we have to protect the worker from chemistry. That's um, um, absolutely must. Then we have to take care about emissions. We have air emissions. We have also water emissions. So I have to tell you, for us, this is clear. But we have some countries, they have no wastewater legislation. No. In Peru, you can get organic cotton, but I don't know one mill with the wastewater treatment. In Bangladesh, we have thousands of leather and textile mills, and we have just five wastewater treatments. In China, we have no air emission legislation. In some process, in textile, we have up to 20, 30 percent of chemistry in the air. And everybody that flew in China knows they don't see the sun many times. So, and at the end, if we have also a, a good wastewater treatment, we have waste. So we have sludge, and we have to manage sludge. And if we want to take care about that, if we are talking about the sustainable production, we have to take care about everything. We cannot talk about only this end product, the textile, and measure, measure formaldehyde and some metals or whatever. This is only the half of the through. So we have to go deeper, and we have to manage everything. I give you a few examples. Dye kitchen, so the dye house manager is exposed to dye stuffs. They are rated R43, that means sensitizing. This, some dye stuffs, they are, have a sensitizing character. Also, natural dye stuffs could have a sensitizing character. So we have to protect the worker there. Another example is APO, that's exactly the point that Greenpeace was mentioned. These are dispersing agents, fantastic uh, product with a really a fantastic function. They are not critical, but they break down in the wastewater treatment, in the biological step, and create a metabolite that is fish toxic. So the basis is okay, but then in the wastewater treatment, we create a toxic substance. So that doesn't work. Or, for example, a simple polyamide, six. If we do a, a normal process, we have to fix the width. We have to make the first process for, for a knit, underwear, or whatever it is. Polyamide six is, is many times used. We have a caprolactam, that's a monomer. We have that as an emission. And uh, caprolactam is in the same group like formaldehyde in Germany. So to give you uh, an idea about uh, the toxicity of the substance. And we have only a simple mechanical process and we have a poison. So is this really an issue? 
Yes, it is an issue. Our industry is using a lot of chemicals, a lot of chemicals, and this is the average we found in our industry. So for synthetics, we are using 100 to 800 grams for one kilogram textile. In cotton, it's more, it's 300 up to 1.5 kilogram, and this 1.5 kilogram we found in a, in a mill, they are producing organic cotton, by the way. And this is not the end. If we calculate also the pesticides and the fertilizer in the growing phase, so we end up maybe with 1.8 kilogram. So that means our industry has a huge impact to environment if we do not take care about end of pipe, the effluent, uh, the, the emissions. So we have to do something. But on the other side, we need the chemistry. Without chemistry, we cannot make all this nice stuff we saw this morning, the picture we saw. We need chemistry to get the right color, to get the right performance. So it's a must. And it's important, the information I will give to you is, chemistry is not in principle bad. It's more what we are doing with the chemical. If we do not manage the process properly, then we create the problem. Mostly, we do not manage a process. Now, we go a little bit deep when we are talking about uh, uh, challenges uh, with chemical management. I have to tell you, yes, these are chemicals we can buy from chemical companies worldwide. And uh, the reality is, we heard this morning with natural dyestuffs, we have not always one dyestuff. We have some byproduct, the same we have with chemical made in a synthetic way. We have many times we have byproducts and we have impurities. And we heard this morning that especially brands are working with so called restricted substance list and mostly these byproducts and impurities are listed in this restricted substance list. And this is a nice example to give you an idea how complex this industry is. A simple softener, you can buy on Walmart or whatever, wherever you want to buy, a simple softener could have up to 30 single components. The softener we applicate in our industry, it's very complicated. It's up to 30 components. And then we have from these 30 components, we have impurities and byproducts. The same is with dye stuff. A synthetic dye stuff is not one dye stuff. We have 15 up to 30 components, dispersing, aging, anti-dusting products, and, and, and. And this is what we have to manage. Sometimes it's not the dye stuff, the problem, it's the byproduct or the dispersing agent, what is in, or something else. So, and at the end of the day, for the guy in the dye house, it's very difficult to deal with all this regulation I showed you before. So, a dye house manager is mostly not a chemist, is not an environment specialist, and he has so many eco labels. He's working not for one brand, maybe he's working for 30 or 50 or 100 brands with different restricted substance list, with different uh, uh, performance level. So if he's working for automotive industry, it's definitely different than if he's working for uh, uh, a sports company or, or a fashion brand, that's totally different. So, and if we want to manage that, we need the right tools. We need information about exposure, we need hazard data, and that's very important. In the future, we need also hazard data in Europe from, from natural products. I'll give you an example. The European Union banned 27 natural perfumes because of their sensitizing character. Uh, we need uh, experts. Uh, they have knowledge in that, that area. Branch knowledge is important. And we have need also method to cross-check this calculation in the real world. That means if we have an idea from our calculation, we have to measure that in the mill itself if this is accurate. Uh, and we believe in blue sign 
only an input-oriented system works. So if we go further with the approach we had, we test the final product, I don't think that's the right way to do. Then it's too late. You know how long a design step goes. If you really start with new ideas, and that takes 12, 12 months or longer till we have the product in the store. And uh, at the end, and if we find PCP in a final fabric, we cannot ship it back to China. We have to solve the problem first. And therefore, for us, it's important. No data, no business. We need this data from the chemical companies or from the producer of natural fragrance we have also in our system. We need the information to give the supply chain the right uh, feedback if they can use that chemical and in which way they can use this chemical. So, our approach is a little bit different and I learned from the past then I'm since I found out this morning, I'm since 40 years in that business, unbelievable. <laughs> but what I learned is no compromise in functionality, quality or design. So I like to work with designers, with product managers, it's it's important if they have an idea, we have to bring the solution on the table without compromising. Otherwise, we cannot sell our product. So that's uh, very important. How can we solve that problem? That means we have to choose the best available technology. So the technology that is available today. So And wastewater treatment, air emission, workplace condition is not an issue. We can find the right chemistry. That's not an issue. Input stream management is absolutely uh, a fact. It's a must. You have to start in, in the beginning. And you need a chemical rating system. You cannot say because it's natural, it's good. Because it's synthetic, it's bad. Or the opposite. We need facts, hard facts. And that we can give the right information with the product to the producer. And we need a holistic approach. We cannot only bring a solution for, for organic cotton. We need also for other fibers the solution. Therefore, our holistic approach includes also the chemical industry or the source. We need all stakeholders in the supply chain. And these are our five principles. So our idea is, first of all, it's resource productivity. We can manage the toxics. Definitely, if we spend money, we can manage that. The biggest problem is that we can work in a way that we need less resources, that we need uh, less energy, less water, less chemistry, and that we get a better product. And we have to manage air emission, occupational health, water emission, and consumer safety at the end. With that vision in mind, we created uh, principles for the supply chain and for chemicals and uh, consumer. And Based on that, we came up with this input stream management system. We cannot solve the problem at the end. We have to start in the beginning. And therefore, the key is this tool we developed is the screening. We go in a mill, we check all the chemicals, every single uh, kilogram of chemistry, that we get a full transparent situation. We break down the complex chemical issue for the workers, they have no chemical background and give them an easy solution. And we check the situation of resource consumption. And I can tell you, sometimes it's unbelievable. We are using up to 700, 800 liters of water and we can do it with 25 or 30 liters of water. Sometimes you have seen this chemical consumption, it's unbelievable. We could, could reduce in that mill with 1,500 chemicals during, during the screening we could reduce three or 400 grams, only to tell them what they have to do. The chemical rating must be easy because the knowledge in the supply chain, we created therefore blue, gray, black. Black is easy, don't use chemicals, they are black rated. Blue are always the best one. Today we are talking about green chemistry, you can say this is green chemistry, and the gray we need for a performance level. So if you need a certain performance level, maybe we have a chemical with an issue in air emission or in water emission. Then we have to manage that. Where is the problem? 
the blue tool is the chemical rating system for chemical companies. So we developed that long before each started. We had this chemical re registration process so that we have the information and a chemical company can immediately see if they are okay or not. It's like a filter. They see if they come through the filter or not. The chemicals they are through this filter are in a, in a database and the dye house manager can go to this database and select the right dye stuff, the right softener or whatever a brand needs for, a, for the performance. And at the end, we are there where we want to like. So we want not to make compromise in functionality, quality or design. We need, on the other hand, a more sustainable product. And the sustainable product means a product that uh, we can wear over years. And now my message to the designers today. So in the past, price was an issue and fashion and, and you have uh, performance was an issue but today we have to think a little bit more we have to think about end of life we have to think about new things redesign uh, we have to think about recycling so if you can uh, produce a product that is we, where we can make a disassembly or something like that that's a huge issue so we have really an interesting challenge. So the designers today have a, a new part in their creat creativity. And uh, I have to say that's the interesting, the very interesting part to really make an intelligent product and with a long lasting design. And then we have the product we need for our future. So thank you very much. I, I cannot show you nice products, but I brought something from Switzerland that is Swiss chocolate. So for, <laughs> for, for, for every question, you, uh, you will get one Swiss chocolate. That's a good, all right. This is for the, the dares ones. Uh, oh my God, you really did. I have a few. Okay, so who wants to ask the first question? Hi, I'm a young designer. I just graduated from Parsons last year. Um, and this is something that's very important to me uh, as I'm starting to build my brand that I hope to launch for the next few years. Um, do you guys work with young designers? Do you, have, um, do you speak a lot at seminars like this? Do you have other um, resources, websites, things like that where people can start to learn more um, about even in, in my own sourcing, because obviously starting up from a, a small point of view, recent graduates with, a, with not a lot of uh, experience working with different vendors and things like that, um, what's, your, what's your advice or, or do you have perhaps um, like a resource list that might make my search a little easier? So thank you very much. That's a very good question. What we are offering is uh, we are working with brands to start optimizing uh, their supply chain. So a customer, Island Fisher, is here from us. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, for example, we are working with, with the Patagonias, with the North Face, with the REI, so a lot of sports brands, but we have also a few uh, fashion brands. And uh, a few things you can find on our website, but education is really, uh, I would say, a very important piece, and we are in the right building. So. And uh, I remember the book from, I got from Tamara and in, in, the, in the beginning, in, uh, in, in the first page, she made a, a statement that they will invite also people from production like me. So they know the real things, how, how it is the real world on the production floor level. And I think we, we need both. So we have to give young people a feedback and, and the influence and especially designers are the decision maker at the end of the day and the designer has, has it in hand if we have less impact and, and the better product and that's key for me, designer and product manager, these two uh, pieces are key for a sustainable product. Oh, I have the mics. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I get to ask. Um, yeah, I wondered if you had any advice for assessing the risk of combinations of things. Like I teach and students are doing hands-on work and uh, you read the data sheet on one thing, but then you're combining it with something else and you read the data sheet on that. But is there a way to assess you know, new combinations that you're making as a dyer? So if I understood you right, uh, the only thing is we cannot, we have to select all chemicals. So in, we, we're talking about uh, a dye house. But the dye house is only a part and everybody is looking about the dyes because the dyes you can see in the river. What we can see in the river are many chemicals we are using in pretreatment, in finishing. They are much more critical than the dyes. So many times dyes are, n please correct me, but uh, dyes are visible, but not so critical. Many things in wastewater, for example, is much more critical and not visible. So we have to take care about everything. And, and textile starts with, w in the beginning, with the yarn, and then, you know, weaving a huge impact, for example, is, is, is sizing and desizing. So we have, uh, in, in a warp, we have 18% to 20% weight percent size we have to take away. So if we have a, a normal cotton, we have 10% impurities from nature. Then we add sizes. So that means 150 to, to 200 uh, kilos of one ton Cotton is in the wastewater at the end, so the, the impact is huge. Also, if we start with the natural product and if we are using natural size, so the impact is huge. And therefore, talking about sustainability means the best way I would recommend to you is a, an LCA aspect, life cycle assessment. And there is a tool available for everybody. Developed, started in the, in the States by the OIA. This is the echo index, uh, beta.org. There you can find a lot of information. What is the impact of a product? That's, for me, the best tool available. And it started in the OIA. This is the organization of the outdoor industry. They moved that to the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. Nike brought in their material tool and the combination of balls will be maybe the tool in the future so that you as designer product manager can rate your product and have an idea how big is the impact to nature and uh, at, uh, yes, to our environment. And I think this is a very good tool, open for everybody. And it's really um, a comprehensive tool uh, and very good also for teachers uh, to, to work with, with the students. Did you say that URL again? That website address? This is echo index beta, one word, dot org. Hey, Yoshiko. Uh, uh, could you tell me the ordinance, uh, Proposition 65 in California, what is that? I was uh, alarmed. Pro Be Proposition 65 is a legislation uh, with 850 chemicals. They are in the focus of the Californian uh, government. And uh, a lot uh, of these chemicals, they are listed there. Approximately four to 500 are related to textile business too. So if you develop something, or in our blue tool, we consider also this legislation so that we ha if the dye stuff is in our tool, that this uh, legislation is considered. So, and the Proposition 65 is maybe, I would say, the most critical legislation. And there is one reason, because we have no endpoints. They don't say 100 ppm in the final product is, is not good. Only the chemical is mentioned. We have only maybe 10% with endpoints. And that's a difficulty for all, also from a lawyer point of view, to deal in the US, in, in the United States. One example is Lycra. Can, uh, can you identify any uh, current trends in fashion that are, are proving to be particularly hazardous or toxic? Thank you for that question. <laughs> Thank you for that question. So, uh, I, would, I cannot 
talk for the chemical industry. I am not the representative of the chemical industry, but I can tell you, so we have solutions in wool without heavy metals. We have uh, uh, in the reactive area for cotton, we have everything. One problem is, this is a turquoise uh, uh, area. There we have a copper uh, complex dye stuff. That's the only alternative we have today. For synthetics, I would say we have the only problem we have in synthetic is with, uh, with dispersed dye that they have a sensitizing potential. So if we are close to skin for running shirt for Nike, Adidas, or Puma, or whatever, there we have a restriction for sensitizing dye stuffs, so that's an issue. But from a color shade, I have to say we have, we have alternatives today. We have alternatives. But there are the bad ones. And maybe one last word from my side to you, but I think that is one of the most important. And for you, we had a textile industry in the States, in Europe, and we shifted this, as you know, in a very short time, within 20, uh, 25 years to Asia. That's a fact. A few survived like you, but not a lot. And now we have the same with the chemical industry. So the three big guys, the Clarion, the Dye Star, and the Huntsman. Everybody moved to Asia. And we have reached this European legislation, what is very hard. And we have no textile chemical production anymore in Europe. So that's also a way to find a place where you can produce your product without this very high hurdle of chemical production. So, and this is a fact, and that means that the chemical sourcing is in Asia like the textile sourcing. So that would be the problem in the future, and that was my key point to this uh, group. They are confronted with this detox campaign uh, from Greenpeace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And now we welcome our final speaker of the afternoon before the break in the round table, Linda Gross. Linda is a practicing designer, consultant, and assistant professor at California College of the Arts. She co-founded East Breeze E Collection, the first complete ecological collect clothing line developed by a major corporation. Linda has advised clients across nonprofit, private, and government sectors on issues of sustainability for almost two decades, including Patagonia, GAP, Sustainable Cotton Project, Aid to Artisans, American Crafts Council, UNDP, and recently co-authored a book, Fashion and Sustainability, Design for Change. Welcome, Linda. I just wanted to say thank you for putting together a great panel uh, today, and it's really an honor to be part of um, a wonderful, wonderful set of people you put together. It's really nice to get this diversity of perspectives. Um, so the presentation I'm going to make today is uh, Color and Sustainability Design for Change. And it's an echo of the, um, the title of our book, uh, Fashion and Sustainability Design for Change. And it's very much from the perspective of um, a conventional fashion designer uh, working in industry becoming aware of issues of sustainability while I was working at Esprit, and then using that lens to look critically at what we do and how we do it, and coming to some common sense conclusions, really. Um, so it's going to follow a little bit, just lightly, my own trajectory, first working um, at Esprit, you know, a, a mainstream uh, company, and then uh, with A2 Artisans and Artisans, um, and then I'm going to pause a little bit and reflect on what the traditional role of design is and um, how those roles are beginning to change in the context of sustainability. And then I'll give a couple of examples of designers who are stepping into those new roles, just very early examples, and then close with a few norms that maybe start to shift in the context that we're talking about. And you're a very intimidating audience because I'm already getting thirsty. Um, <clears throat> I'll settle in in a minute. Um, so I wanted to, um, just for the purpose of this presentation, talk a little bit about 
um, colour in the fashion industry, in culture and design. Uh, just very briefly, um, but in the fashion industry, we use colour really, it's the quickest, fastest, most cost-effective way to refresh a garment. And we use, well, in comparison to, say, changing the fabric or changing the silhouette. And we use colour as designers to balance a collection, to create cohesion and variety, and also to distinguish our line of clothing on um, the retail floor in a, in a sea of competitive merchandise. Um, from a cultural standpoint, um, well, let me show you a couple of images. Um, who would deny, for example, the sensuality and the power of the black dress? Or the courageous and uh, sexiness of a woman wearing Valentino's red dress. These are cultural icons that we have created. And designers know these cultural icons, color icons and all kinds of icons, past and present. And we also know the directives and needs of industry in terms of balanced collections. And we pull this together along with our own sensibilities where we get inspiration from all kinds of disparate sources like, for example, old socks bordered in Indian Bazaar. And we pull this together to create a cohesive collection um, where we will balance color all the way from the tiny detail on a button in different proportions through different fabrics and patterns, um, different colorways, and so on, all the way up to the collection itself, where this one might, for example, get a bright, one single bright blue jacket um, on a runway. And so designers are always working towards positive ends, balancing these dimensions and these scales. Um, so when I was working at Esprit, um, it was clear to me uh, when Doug Tompkins, who was a good friend with Yvonne Chouinard of Patagonia, and they uh, saw the outdoors being degraded by increased use and wanted to use their businesses for change, um, and so we were all challenged at the company to uh, reduce the environmental impact of the, comp of the company. And uh, so it was clear when we were looking at the product, working for Esprit, which is a junior company known for its bright color palette and its sort of California fresh style, that we had to have color and we couldn't simply do an unbleached, undyed line, which was very popular in the early 90s. Um, we can only sell a, a, a single color once, so our merchandisers wouldn't be very happy. Um, and our uh, customers would get bored very easily. And so I knew straight away that we'd need bright colors. Um, and I assumed, um, while I was looking at toxicity, that seemed like the critical thing to me, and I assumed that natural was better than synthetic. At the time, Peter. Um, <laughs> And I proceeded to call um, the big chemical dye companies and ask them if they could make natural dyes commercially viable, not realizing that they were two different worldviews at the time. And I got zero responses. And then it wasn't until I hooked up with a technical person at UC Davis who reframed the question. Um, and the question was, how can we optimize the um, uh, ecological performance of dyes and dyeing? And that's when I got a response from Nelson Hauser at uh, Sibagaygi, and that began a whole education looking at water, energy, and toxicity uh, in dye stuffs. So what we chose to do was work with uh, Sibagaygi Sibacron C dyes. They were bifunctional fiber reactive dyes. Um, they um, adhered to the cloth in the 85% range, when typical at that time was 60%. So that meant less dye stuff going off into the wastewater. They performed well in a low liquor ratio, which was 40, 4 to 1 water uh, to fabric ratio, when the typical at that time was 20 to 1, or at best 12 to 1. So that really saved a lot of wild water being diverted from natural resources and through the mill. Um, it also meant that we were using less dye stuff and less of, less of those chemical additives in, in the dye bath in solution, because it was a smaller volume of water. And it meant that there was less heat needed to heat up the dye bath. But in any case, we chose cold pad batch dyeing, um, which, as the name suggests, operated at room temperatures. So we greatly reduced energy use. Um, and the, this board, by the way, was the one that I got from Sibagaygi to show to middle management to prove that we could do an eco line with color. Um, so it was all about proof, visual proof. 
Um, but I've circled these colors because we, um, we chose not to use Kelly greens and turquoise because it needed that copper complex to fix up that, those high fixation rates. Um, so we were concerned, as most mainstream companies are, with evenness, repeatability, light and wash fastness, and crocking. And you can see that the look of the garments was pretty much the same aesthetic as any other garment that was done by Esprit at that time. We were selling to the Esprit customer in Esprit stores. We had a really tight circle of style that we, Doug Tompkins, would not let us step outside of. Um, and even now, the most progressive companies will say that any acts of sustainability need to be invisible because there can be no compromise of desirability to the consumer. And I'm going to circle back to that notion of desirability and consumer because both are critical for sustainability. So after leaving Esprit, I've worked to, you know, in different sectors of the economy, including with A2 Artisans. Um, and they're a nonprofit organization working with craftspeople around the world to help them build micro enterprises. And um, <clears throat> in this situation, color has really the same function as industry. And by that, what I mean is artisans will make an item, um, they'll finish it, and then they'll take it to a bazaar to sell it. Um, but if you do merchandise product groups with them and merchandise colors with them, then they have an opportunity to sell that item more than once, you know, more than one color, more than if, if you have a pillow, a rug, and an ottoman, for example, you're going to sell more than just a rug. Um, so there I am on the left in someone's back garden merchandising the hand-dyed felt, the red colors over there on the left. Um, and then you can see some pillows that were developed in red tones, cool tones, and yellow tones. In this case, we're trying to increase the sales and, of course, the income back to the workers' cooperative. Um, now, when you're working with artisans, the development processes are very rudimentary. And so you see those immediate benefits coming back to the artisans, but you also see the immediate impacts. They're very visible. Um, and you can see over there on the left uh, the spent dye bath that the ladies were working with was tipped out in their backyards uh, right next to where they were growing their beets and potatoes. Um, and we knew from going to the bazaars that they were getting these dye stuffs um, actually spooned into these little sort of um, rolled up paper packages, newspaper packages with Russian writing on in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and no material safety data sheet or toxicity report and so on. Um, and so this was quite alarming. They thought it was quite funny that I found it alarming. Um, but that's when we contacted uh, Michelle actually and brought her in to work on some natural dyes, which you can see over here um, on the right, really beautiful um, array of colors. We were, again, here focused on toxicity. In that rudimentary development system, this is not a European or a Swiss or an American um, factory, you know, this is, they're, they're working in their backyards. Um, and so this is what we were working with. This was an appropriate technology for that particular situation. Um, let me think, do I have something else to say? I feel like I do. Hang on. Oh, yes. <laughs> so um, let me just uh, backtrack a little bit. So you can see how, you know, going from the line of thinking at Esprit and through working with artisans, how sustainability demands, um, oh no, I'm sorry, I need to just backtrack a little bit more. With the natural dyes, it brought up a whole other level or line of inquiry again. So where were those natural dye stuffs going to come from? Were we actually building it in a dependency with the artisans on an outside source of materials where they wouldn't be able to control quality delivery price critically? Um, then could we develop natural dyes locally? What, um, you know, what plants were available during what time? Uh, when did they yield their color and so on? And can we synchronize that window of availability of color with the needs of the brands that were working on retail cycles completely disconnected from natural cycles? Um, so you can see how sustainability gets you to, it really gets the mind to move from thinking about the product, about the color, to the dye stuff, to the dye system, to the context in which the dye system is used, and all the way back to nature itself. Because ultimately, it's nature's capacity to provide the raw materials 
for our products and processes and nature's tolerance of being able to take back the toxicity or the toxins or the waste that come from those processes that decides what is and is not sustainable. Um, now, I, I think personally, uh, call me biased, <clears throat> but I think that considering all these dimensions and these scales um, when you're developing things, I feel that the designer has an innate uh, propensity uh, to deal with that. For, for me, it's not that different from the design process, all the dimensions and the different scales of thinking. Um, but for a designer working in industry, um, it's really difficult to exercise that sensibility, that, ex that extended or expanded sensibility, because even in the most progressive companies, designers are in a studio. We're a very segmented industry and we're isolated. And we're facing the market and we're looking at competition and the consumer. We're facing this way. And um, we are, you know, the supply chain is completely invisible. We might give some lab dips to someone, but generally speaking, it's someone else who's working in the supply chain. And it feels very, it's really difficult information to fathom. And really, marketing directs what designers do. We spend 15 hours a day developing novel products for. Uh, to increase the sales of the companies and the profits for the companies that we work for. That's, that's what we do. We're directed by marketing. And so when a design brief for sustainability comes along and the directive is um, that any acts of sustainability need to be invisible, then the outcome is pretty predictable because we have a very narrow range within to work and very few tools to work with. So, well, I'm glad you're laughing. Good. It's not meant to offend. I mean, I'm obviously exaggerating something here, but you get, you're getting my point, so, so that's a good thing. Um, so, um, but if you are step out of the studio and you are exposed to things, then first of all, you see the impacts. Um, you're also exposed to people that you can interact with on solutions. And you also see the underlying cultural and social influences um, that affect things. And I'm going to give you a quick, quick example with cotton uh, because I live in California and I've worked with California farmers and uh, it's, it's an easy way for me to make my point. So the cotton industry, like all industries, knows that we've got an increased population, increased wealth, therefore increased consumption and uh, a world of declining resources and that increasingly those resources, the allocation of those resources is going to become increasingly contentious and ethical, frankly. And so they have got the message that we need to do more with less. And for the cotton industry, that's translating into yielding more per acre. But in California, uh, we're in, we've got one of the most uh, cotton, we've got one of the most productive cotton systems on the planet. We've had access to the best available technology for decades. We apply chemicals with machines, not through labor. Um, these have, can be from the air or from the land. Uh, we mechanically harvest the cotton for efficiency. We've got GPS systems. We've had a genetic modification since 1996 when it was first commercialized. We even laser level the land so that irrigation water that's very expensive uh, can flow efficiently from one end of the field to the other. California farmers yield three and a half bales of cotton fiber an acre. That's about 1,750 pounds, about three or four times more than the average Indian farmer can. This is a tremendous feat of human ingenuity and technological innovation. And yet, at the other end of the supply chain, 68 pounds of clothes are discarded by the average American consumer each year. That's about 34 pairs of jeans. And it's not just the physicality of the genes that goes to waste. All the embodied energy, the natural resources that have been diverted also go to waste. And the human ingenuity in extracting those resources more efficiently also goes to waste. So you can't help when you witness the massive mobilization of natural resources for commerce on the one hand and the sheer volume of waste on the other you can't help but question the logic of yielding, producing, and even designing more. And yet our industry, our profession, are utterly dependent upon creating both these landscapes, the agricultural landscape and the post-retail landscape, at greater and greater volumes and faster and faster speeds. So my point is that it's not enough just to consider 
technology in isolation. You have to be thinking also about the social, cultural context in which we design and make clothes. What makes the industry, what makes consumers behave this way? And in order to do that, the designer needs to break out of the confines of working in the studio. We need to feel comfortable working with people directly, like farmers, for example. Develop the confidence to work directly with horticulturalists, dyers, chemists. Have the economic literacy to work alongside CEOs. Interact with makers, researchers. And last but not least, work with wearer collaborators. Because consumers only have two choices when it comes to fashion and sustainability, and that's to buy or not to buy. And as designers for consumers, our success is measured by the number of units our designs sell. Whereas wearer collaborators have many opportunities to interact with fashion and sustainability, and as designers, we've got many ways to engage with them on solutions. So here are just a few examples of designers stepping into these new roles in the context of sustainability. If we look at designers working in industry, for example, like myself, my background is knitwear design. And so I tend to think in terms of yarn. And when I hear that natural dyes are not commercially viable because they dye unevenly, then I would tend to think of dyeing yarns deliberately unevenly so that when they're knitted up, it creates rather a beautiful effect. And yes, the aesthetic changes, but it's a wonderful aesthetic, arguably more valuable than just a simple solid knit. And what's more, if the natural dye were to fade in one particular area over another, which is one of the criticisms of natural dyes, um, then with this pattern, the eye bounces around and is less likely to notice that uneven fading. Now imagine if a designer had an opportunity to work with a cognitive scientist to research how the eye bounces around on different patterns and textures and how the results of that research might open up the potential for natural dye applications. Sasha Duer of Permacouture is another example of someone stepping into these new roles. What Sasha notes is that we have lost our culture of colour we're no longer aware of what colours are available during what season in our particular region and how that palette of colours might differ in, say, Northern California from other regions like, say, here in New York. And she's aiming to bring that culture of colour back. And her background as an artist and designer colours the way that she approaches this particular issue that she's identified. And so what she does... Um, is she connects with um, local chefs and she does these dinners to die for where the participants are invited uh, to forage for dye stuffs and uh, build a dye bath or put, put it in the dye bath, not literally build it, um, dye something that they brought and then everybody sits down to a meal um, that uh, includes the ingredients that they've used in the dye bath. So, what she's doing here, and she does an installation in this particular case, it was with fennel, and they were eating a meal that was with fennel. But through experiential learning, um, and by piggybacking onto something that people are already habituated to doing, which is eating in season and locally, she's suggesting, she's opening up their sensibilities and suggesting that they might consider doing the same thing with clothing and with textiles. Um, another designer working with local colour is Mimi Robinson um, uh, of Bridging Cultures Through Design. And she works with artisans all around the world, um, but she would never come into a particular place with a ready-made colour palette that they have to meet or with a set of numbers. Um, rather, what she talks about is coming in and absorbing, being aware of the local colour, whether it's a landscape or whether it's here is a graveyard, um, they've got completely different cultural color references than we do. Um, and she draws out the color and the inspiration for the work that she does while still being attentive to what a particular market, whether it's local, regional, or international, is going to appreciate. So it's really by being sensitive or sensible in the place where she's working, as well as being attentive to market, that she really bridges uh, culture, and in this case, color through design.
Another person who's with us today, uh, Louis Van Rivas Sanchez, um, has an organization, Bourguenville Couture. So he brings his background to bear on the issue of color. Um, his background is um, couture level print designs for people like John Galliano, Comte de Garcin, and others. And so what he, it was natural when he started looking at sustainability that he was drawn to natural dyes and the hands-on making aspect of that. And what he's done is connected around the world with masters uh, to draw on their wisdoms uh, with the intention of reviving natural dyes for the market that he knows, which is the couture market. It included, by the way, uh, the natural dye folks that we have here today, who he's connected with. Um, I wanted to make a point here, because what, what um, I see a parallel here with Louis work and the zero waste pa um, designers, and I think Timo's, yeah, somewhere here, um, where designers are, start, are, are noticing, they're starting to feel that the skills of practice, the normal skills of practice that we learn, like pattern making and draping and so on, when you come into industry, they're taken out of the hands of the designer and they're done by some technical function across the world somewhere. Levin's, Levin's noting the same about coloring. Um, and just as the, as the zero waste pattern makers want to re-elevate those skills back into the craft of practice, so Levin's looking to do the same thing with color. You see the parallels. So design is, in a way, it's like taking back design. It's like reactivating design. Um, I have to, I had to do that. The, my co-author, Kate Fletcher, is, if you haven't read her work or aware of her work, she's just fantastic. And her background is fashion research, so she brings that to bear um, on these issues. And her, her most recent um, project is Local Wisdom, and this involves collecting stories from volunteer members of the public about the user's craft, the user's craft as expressed in, in garments that they already own. <clears throat> And um, she collects uh, their stories and documents them and photographs them. And they're available on a website, localwisdom.info. And I selected one um, on color for this presentation. I'm going to read it out to you. Um, so this is a lady who works at the House of Commons in England. And she says, this pink silk shirt was given to me by one of my closest friends who I've known since I was 11. It's a testament to a very, very long and very, very strong friendship. One of the things I like most about it is it's coral pink, and the girl who gave it to me has a tendency to wear one color head to toe, and I'm completely in awe of it because I can't. It's like a window to a world that I really aspire to because I've got so much respect for people who can wear color. They look like they're so much fun. So I think a little bit of her and her attitude to dressing has come through to me. I'm tearing up a little bit here. But, I mean, what we're exploring, what local wisdom explores, is the immaterial aspects of clothing and this emotional intensity of garment sharing. It's an emergent sense of self that she's talking about and a sense of belonging that's so elementally human um, that's afforded through clothing and fashion. And these immaterial aspects are often missed and sometimes even dismissed um, by our industry's focus on material products and the imperative of speed, production, low cost, and maximum sales. Um, but what local wisdom also reminds us of is that ideas of what sustainability is or should be are not always or not only in the hands of commerce or the size and scale and power of business, but they're also through particular or even particular experts for that matter or even designers. Um, but they emerge from these culturally evolved and uh, emotionally embedded wisdoms also. And it reminds me in particular that solutions are in, within the reach of all of us and that there's not just one solution, but that there are many solutions. Um, so in terms of uh, the shifting norms, and I wanted to rephrase that and say unfreezing norms, because I feel like Things are entrenched and they need to sh shift, but unfreeze has a nice quality about it. It's, it's going to take a while, but it will, it will come. Um, if we go back to uh, the little black dress, um, that black, for example, like any dark color, uh, tends to leave more dye stuff in the wastewater than on the cloth. I learned because I interacted with a chemist today on that. Um, so maybe we need to revisit 
um, that cultural icon. And maybe we need to write a chapter at the back of that book that's appropriate for our times. And it's the little charcoal dress. Um, you know, that red dress from Valentino, red is a highly fugitive, well, synthetic red, maybe natural red, is very highly fugitive. Um, and it takes a lot of rinsing to get that dye stuff off the surface of the cloth so that it doesn't crock on the skin with wear. So maybe there's an emergent um, dye technology, dye bath reuse, where every time we design a red dress, it's accompanied with tonal reds um, all the way to pink so that we can use that dye stuff out of the bath. Um, uh, we are in an age of um, the internet, as we know, with uh, uh, online-only companies. I'm not a digital native, so I struggle with this language. Um, with online-only companies being launched on a daily basis, uh, one of which is this company, Better Brand, and they're local in San Francisco. They do uh, commuter bike pants, is what they do. And they launch a product a week. And it sounds really shocking, because we're so used to fast fashion being a bad thing. But the key is they launch one product, and it's not a whole collection. And they are driven by the pull of crowdsourcing. So when they launch an item, it's basically they already know it's going to sell. So they produce what, what is already sold, in a way, as opposed to the push of a collection of merchandise out to retail, and then selling what you've already produced. So it's just an innately less wasteful model. Um, and they've actually never lost money on a style. But my point for color here, just in case you're wondering, is when you're selling direct to a wearer online, does Stephen on the left really care if Joe on the right has the same color gray as he does? That repeatability issue is really only important for a buyer that's merchandising a whole collection at retail and you see these colors next to each other. So in these new contexts, in these shifting contexts of sustainability and also new business models, we need to revisit our social, our cultural, our industrial, our professional norms. Uh, revisit them, uh, recalibrate them. Um, Rachel Botsman and Rue Rogers in their book, What's Mine is Yours, document the rise of collaborative consumption and it's incredible incredible force and really growing by leaps and bounds. Who here has a friend who might buy something and then exchanges it online or sold thing on Craigslist or you know, on eBay or even has friends who trades um, uh, uh, vintage fabrics online, or vintage furniture and so on. Um, and people are, are exchanging amongst each other. So actually if business doesn't engage with the consumers and as wearer collaborators, those, they're already collaborating with themselves. Um, but if that garment there, that red shirt, um, does the person on the left, um, and does it matter if that red shirt is um, uh, light and wash fast, say, for example? It does, right? If, we, if we're designing to share, then things like that, that kind of durability is important. Um, but repeatability, again, it's not, not so critical as light and wash fastness. So again, we just need to visit our industrial, our, our norms of practice, and they may shift, they may not, but at the very least, they need re recalibrating. So, um, so just to close, this is where the industry is, very focused on products and processes. It's really good work, it really has to be done. Thank goodness Martin and Peter are working on things like this. Um, it's a really opaque supply chain and very dirty. Um, but we also need to be looking at behavior, both the behavior of the industry and the behavior of consumers. Um, and in order to do that, we need to look at society and culture, those underlying cultural and societal, because that's where the direct is, where the messaging comes that directs uh, the behavior. Um, and so we see that designers will continue to work in the private sector, um, moving sustainability along, and, but also populating all the, other, all the other sectors, whether it's research or public areas and you know, interacting with as many people as possible, optimizing solutions for sustainability, coming back into the private sector, reinformed and so on. It's almost like we've just discovered the telescope and there's a million more places um, to work or to be or to practice sustainability. Um, and so we also see that uh, this dominant narrative 
or this singular idea of what is or isn't um, sustainability is going to become much more pluralistic. Um, it's a varied aesthetic coming from many different people, from many different places, uh, based on individual abilities, appropriateness to place. And um, I would say that it's a really, really, I wish I was 20 years younger, actually. It's a very, very exciting time to be a designer looking at sustainability with all this potential. Um, and I will leave it at that. Brief questions, and then we are going to take a 15-minute break where you can have a cup of coffee or something. And uh, we'll come back for the round table. I know that that's going to be the <laughs> time. So who wants, uh, who, who wants to ask questions? Anybody? <laughs> no, but I would have to say that English chocolate does rival Swiss chocolate. <laughs> um, so, um, yes. Hi, thank you. I really enjoyed your presentation. Very engaging. Um, I wanted to mention something because I like that idea of engaging with the consumers. Um, I'm from Eileen Fisher Company, so we have a customer who's very loyal and um, we have that kind of brand awareness. Um, but what we've done recently is kind of building upon our longevity of our garments and timelessness of this design um, by launching an initiative that's called um, Green Eileen. And it's, um, not, I'm sure I'm not going to give it total justice because I didn't look at all the <laughs> fine print on the website. But anyway, the idea is that um, the customers can bring in their used garments to the store, Eileen Fisher garments, um, they're rewarded with like a token value on a kind of shopping card, but the garments are taken in by our um, foundation partner, um, it's founded by Eileen Fisher, and they're cleaned and prepared for like a second life in the store that's um, called Green Eileen, am I right? It's like yeah. it's the store's name is Green Eileen. There's one in uh, Yonkers area in Westchester or Scarsdale area where they're sold um, kind of like a second-hand store, and all the profits go back into supporting the foundation that supports um, causes related to women and girls' um, issues in developing world or here in the local communities. So it's kind of like building upon, you know, the longevity of the garment, the durability, and um, designing for something that's not disposable, and then also like giving back to the community, but also engaging the consumer and kind of empowering them to continue doing something good, like reducing the waste stream. But So there's many different ways I think that the brands you know, can do that. I mean, there's Patagonia model, there's different models, but you know, in today's social world, social media world, there's many different ways to do that. Yeah, when, when you mentioned the Patagonia model, just in case people are not aware of it, you're talking about them reselling their items on, on eBay. Yeah, yeah, so there's many. And uh, Marks and Spencers in the UK just did a, what was it called, Peter? Do you know what it was? A swap, a swapping, yeah, where people brought their garments back into uh, the store. I'm not, I'm not sure what happens to them after that, but and I know Levi's has encouraged people to take old Levi's back to Goodwill also. Um, but I also know that one of the biggest things that Goodwill that ends up in those bales that you saw is jeans. So, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, yeah, but as, as we just become more aware of these things and these models and as, when these, as these models work, um, the, there's going to be more and more ideas. Oh, I pulled a quote today and it was from Martin. I thought it was great. Um, Martin said, Martin said, he said, like, like Perkins Morve showed what could be done, right? And that started this whole synthetic dye it's the same thing as Eileen Fisher or as a Patagonia or a designer at the back of the room or whoever can show what can be done. Then people go, oh, and the, you know, a switch goes off and then you know, all kinds of similar things. Um, are, you know, people emulate and we watch each other. We're human, we watch each other really closely. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's, there's, there's many, many, many possibilities. Okay, anyone else? All right, so let's give, 
let's give uh, Linda a round of applause.